Welcome to the Grow Fast Podcast, where we talk with leading sales, marketing, and personal growth experts about how companies can accelerate sales, optimize marketing, and grow their businesses fast. Let's go. Hey, Fred. How are you? Mark, it's great to see you, my friend. Likewise. Hey, I really appreciate you taking time to come on the uh, Grow Fast Podcast. Uh, We are relatively early days here, and to get somebody with your breadth and depth of experience is a great honor. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Awesome. Hey, you know, I've always said that if you want to sell something, you have to believe in it. And it really helps if you are actually passionate about the product or service that you're selling. And I was looking at, you know, your body of work and you have the sales game changer podcast with over 645 episodes. You've written a book called the insight for sales game changers. You're also the co-founder of the Institute for excellence in sales. And, and you have a podcast related to the trials and tribulations of going through Lyme disease, either personally or as a, f- a friend or family member. So clearly you're passionate about sales. And I want to talk to you about that. In parallel with that, you, uh, you know, a, a, a very large amount of your content relates to facilitation of the de- professional development of, of, of women in sales. So you're passionate about that as well. So I want to touch on, on those things. So. To kick things off, um, maybe you can talk about where does that passion for sales, when did it start and, you know, where does it come from? Thank you so much. It's great to see you. And I look forward to talking about all of those topics. Uh, You know, I've, I've met with tens of thousands of sales professionals over my career. I've been fortunate to work at companies like Apple and Compaq Computer. And as a consultant, I've had clients at companies like Microsoft and Oracle. And at the Institute for Excellence in Sales, we work with sales leaders from companies like Amazon Web Services, Hilton, Oracle, et cetera. And, you know, as you're asking the question, I was kind of thinking about that. Um, there's one commonality with every successful salesperson is they've sold to someone, right? Or they've yeah. sold to large entities, but they felt it's always been from them to, to someone. And if you're not energetic, if you're not enthused, if you're not passionate about what you're bringing to the marketplace, then there's no way that your customer is going to be, right? So you have to have that energy. I've always, I've looked at all the commonalities of the great sales professionals and sales leaders that I've worked with. And there's a couple of things which we'll talk about here, but one of the most common things, and it's not charisma because charisma isn't, doesn't really lead to anything, but it's energy and passion. And if you're not convinced that what you're bringing to the marketplace is going to help your customer either become more productive, grow their sales, help their citizens, whatever it might be, then there's no way that you're going to be successful bringing it to market. I've met with a lot of salespeople who didn't believe in their product, who didn't believe in what they were selling at the time. And you could tell, and they weren't successful. There's, you know, the adage you could, you know, a great salesperson could sell ice to Eskimos isn't true. You know, customers will only buy what they believe to be valuable if they're the largest government agency in the world or if they're, you know, an individual looking to buy some lawn care services, whatever it might be. Yeah, I mean, I've kind of, I would say that if you can sell something that you don't believe in, you're kind of borderline sociopath <laughs> because, you know, it's, but, um, you know, I mean, you've, you've developed a tremendous amount of content related to sales and professional development. And so obviously you're passionate about that. Where does that passion come from from you? I mean, you yeah. want it. Salespeople become better at their jobs. Where does that come from? You know, there's, I've been given a lot of thought to this over the years. And uh, most of my career has been in professional marketing, either product marketing, corporate marketing, marketing communications. And the one thing I noticed, my, one of my first jobs was with McGraw-Hill Publishing. And right after college, I was an editor in one of McGraw-Hill's divisions. And we sold these loose leaf books that rated technology products. And I was in the group that created these new products. And this was in the mid eighties over the wall, the cubicle wall were the salespeople. And these were the guys, they were almost all guys who were selling to large corporations like Ford and American Express. And I would hear them over the cube. And this was again, me right out of school. And I would hear how they talk to customers and I hear how they talk to each other. And I would hear how they were talking about things like, Hey, we're going to help American Express really develop a better technology infrastructure by using our, our, uh, our uh, books that help them evaluate products. And I, I reached over and I started talking to them. These guys were my father's age, right? You know, I was in my early twenties, just after college and 
I would ask him questions like, you know, why do you do this? What excites you about it? And yeah, they, I, I could tell in the beginning they were questioning why was this young editor, right? Why were they, why was he asking me these questions? But it was genuine. I wanted to know, like, we're, I'm sitting in these cubes writing these books. What are people doing with them? You right. know, because as I like to tell people, there's no accounting organization, there's no finance, there's no operations if you don't have sales. So mm -hmm. sales really is the uh, the core blood. I worked for a company in the late 90s called Compuware, and it was the largest software company that nobody ever heard of at the time. <laughs> it, was, it was a $2 billion software company that sold wow. billions of mainframe software mm -hmm. and what was called client server software. And the CEO of the company, his name was Pete Carmanos, he said, uh, the last person out the door before we close out the lights is going to be our worst salesperson. So I probably misquoted him a little bit, but the point being that if, if nothing gets sold, then there's no reason to have the business. So what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the product is or the service. If you, if you don't sell it, it, you don't have a business. And so therefore you have this interest in, in selling and, you know, you started off in, as an editor or, or an analyst role. And then, then how did you move into, you know, what prompted you to move into sales? Because for a lot of people moving in from a, a, a fixed salary kind of secure, seemingly secure role into something where you have performance targets and your compensation is tied to performance. And, th and there are always external factors like the market, the competition, whatever. It's kind of a, a, a gutsy move. And, and what prompted you to kind of move in that direction? Yeah, well, again, I, I was the uh, I was a journalism uh, student when I went to Emory University in Atlanta. I was the editor of the newspaper. I was a history major, and it made sense that I was going to go into some type of journalism. So I went to work again for McGraw Hill Publishing as my first job as an editor. But then I started realizing that, uh, and what we did is we analyzed technology companies and mm -hmm. their products. And I started meeting with product marketing people and marketing people and people in sales at the technology companies we were analyzing. And I began to realize that they would all talk about their customers. Mm -hmm. You know, we just sold our technology to the government. We just sold our technology to Bank of America, whatever it might be. And I remember I began to learn that this stuff doesn't really matter if no one's buying it, right? Yeah. Or if no one's using it. So then I was fortunate to go to Apple Computer uh, in marketing, like I mentioned. And I realized real quick that the salespeople were the stars of the company. and. Yeah, we created amazing technology. This was Apple in the late 80s, early 90s. And the technology was the best in the world, but it didn't matter if it wasn't getting sold mm -hmm. and if we didn't satisfy customers. And one of the things I created when I was at Apple was Apple was really big into user groups. And I was in the government uh, division at the time in marketing. And I created what we call the Federal Support Coordinator Program. And it was designed to help our customers be self-supportive. Right. So we will create these events with like two, 300 people. And, um, I began to meet our customers and I began to talk to them. And I said, this is the lifeblood of the company selling to them and then satisfying them. So, uh, it, sales is the hardest job in the company. I always say that. I say that the, the best salesperson has the hardest job. Um, you know, especially now, again, you and I are doing this interview in March of 2024 and customers are in charge and we just came out of you know the most um the pandemic and of course you know there's stuff going all over the world mm -hmm. and it's hard it's very hard and also the customer because of the internet has has shifted it used to be 15 20 years ago the salesperson was in charge he or she would drive all the activity now because of the internet and social networks the customer has their information before they even talk to you in some cases they don't even want to talk to you but the great salespeople are of service and they provide value and they understand what the customer is trying to achieve. Yeah, we all have quotas. We want to reach them. We want to, you know, have uh, the lives that we've depended upon. But it all really comes down to being of value and of service to the customer. So the great salespeople understand that. It's not about what do I got to do today, Mark, to get you to buy this pen. That's, that's, that's not true. It's <laughs> how am I going to help? <laughs> I, I, I love and hate that example, but and I'm, I'm going to come back to that a little bit later on into that, yeah. that, that, that charismatic sale uh, and, and so on. But, uh, but go ahead. The customer doesn't need you. The yeah. customer doesn't need you. So the only way you're going to be successful in sales is by thinking about not just putting yourself in their shoes, but what are they trying to achieve in the next one, two, three, or five years? And how can I be a partner? You know, the great sales leaders that I know and sales professionals are those who are um, embedded in a community, 
yeah. right? You know, they go to industry events. They um, hold sessions of uh, mastermind type things, brainstorms with customers to help under uncover what they're trying to achieve and then providing value to help them get there. Totally agree with you. And it's funny though, um, my one of my first jobs out of college was at a, an assistant editor at a computer magazine. Yeah. And I thought the magazine was all about the editorial and the, you know, look at this beautiful story that, that I've written. And, 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 um, and then one day I was sitting at a lunch and I heard, I overheard a conversation about what the ad sales guys were making. And it was like literally, you know, five fold or five times what, what our editors were making. And I was just blown away. But then I thought about it and I was like, wait a minute, what, what are we doing here? We're, we're actually, we're, 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 we're creating content to wrap around the ads, you know? And, um, and then the light, the, the light bulb went on and within six months I'd moved into a sales role <laughs> and then I, I haven't looked back since, but it's funny. Um, you know, you talk a lot about bringing value to the customer and, uh, and I noticed on your profile um, that you, the Institute for, for Excellence in Sales, uh, you have a big focus on B2B sales, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's drill down on that for a second because in B2B sales, like you said, the customers, they're, you know, that's their profession, it's their job. They have uh, other stakeholders in the organization. They have all the information about the competition, market dynamics, trends, everything before you even step in there. Um, and so if you try to go in there with that charismatic sell, um, I, you know, they're going to shut you down. So can you give some, some additional examples of what you can do as a professional B2B salesperson in terms of, you know, developing trust and, 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 and bringing some additional value? Yeah. So I'll give you two examples. One is, again, you mentioned my podcast is called the sales game changers podcast. We're quickly approaching 700 episodes. That's um, awesome. Yeah, and I, I did a show with a couple of CIOs, chief information officers uh, at large government agencies. And I asked them on the podcast, what do you, what do you want from salespeople? Right. You know, every salesperson uh, wants to get to the C suite. I said, what do you want? And I was surprised by their answer. They said, help us navigate your company. Right. They said, help us understand how to get things done within your company. Right. If we're going to be a customer of yours, how do we, get support? How do we quickly get to a senior level person if we need to? How do we understand, you know, your, all the processes required to get our orders taken care of, you know, those kinds of things. And, you know, interestingly, they didn't say, well, I understand your five, I want to know your five-year technology map. I mean, maybe they yeah. did, but that was the first answer that they gave was help us understand. So again, it goes back to the notion that you need to be of service to your customer. You really yeah. are. You know, you're not selling them things and then dumping them. Yeah, maybe you have an account exec who takes over or a customer service who takes over in some regard, but you know, you need to ensure that you're a partner with your customer to help them achieve your goals. The other thing that relates more importantly to B2B versus B2C, business to consumer, is that most B2B is complex, we call it. So mm -hmm. there's multiple people who are involved in the decision. Right. It's not just like selling to a person. There are a lot of people who have a lot of charisma who are good at one, uh, one call closes, right? Someone who calls to try to get you to do, you know, Medicare or life insurance or lawn care or, you know, whatever it might be. And there's a lot of people who have that energy and they're fearless on the phone, but they don't understand how to navigate through a strategic sale where there's five, seven, 10 people involved and there's budgeting and there's time frames, and there's competition and there's compliance and there's regulations. You know, the great salespeople at companies, again, like the Oracle's, Microsoft's, Hilton's of the world, they understand that the customer has that complexity in their organization. You know, one thing that used to always amuse me is I would go on sales calls with salespeople and every first sales call mark goes great. Right. Yeah. You know, the customer, you're meeting someone new. You're, you're happy because you're there. You're able to answer some of their questions. And I would be uh, amazed that when I would go back with the salesperson to meet with their boss and or sit in a pipeline meeting and the sales rep would say, Oh, we had a great first call. It's, uh, I'm going to rate the sale 50%. There's a 50% likelihood. And I would say, yeah, it was, it was great, but you didn't ask about budget. You know, they didn't tell you who else they're talking to, what else they're working with. They didn't talk about who else is involved. You know, you talk to somebody who called, you know, who took your meeting. We don't know really why they took your meeting, right? Yeah, you know, maybe they were bored. 
you know, maybe yeah. they have a child who wants to go work for you. I don't know. I, I think that um, a lot of, especially junior salespeople, when they first get started, they may be really good at build, uh, building rapport when they go in for that initial meeting. Um, but they're uncomfortable or unsure of how to ask those kind of discovery questions in a quote unquote tactful manner. Um, but I would say that if it's a legitimate prospect sitting across from you, they're okay to answer some of those questions. If, as long as you ask them, you know, in a, in a like I said, tactful manner, and they're, they're, they're used to that. And they want to, they, they want to see that you're taking them seriously as well, because they don't want to just sit around and have a cup of coffee with you. They want to, they want to move things forward or at least be educated. Like you, like you said before. Yeah, I mean, think about why they, why they asked for the meeting, why they requested your meeting. They requested it and they know who you are. You yeah. know, they know that you represent whatever it is, a paper company, a software company, services company. They know, you know, they, they're not shocked. You didn't just show up at their front door, you know, and they're a VP of operations or, you know, a, a director of IT. They know who you are. They've done some research on you. They want to know, are you going to help me be successful in my career? That's another thing that, that not every sales professional understands. You know, the customer wants to be successful in two things, their career and helping their company or agency or organization achieve its goals. And they are tasked with doing that. And they want to do that, you know, to be successful in their job for the next year, five years, 20 years, whatever it might be. I've met with customers who've had the same job for 30 years, right? And, yeah. you know, hopefully they've, they've gotten some progression and they've moved up the ranks, if you will. But it's not uncommon to see someone who's worked at a hospital for 30 years or a government agency or a uh, not-for-profit organization where they've gotten the job, they like doing it, and they enjoy the mission of their company and they're continuing to grow. So they want those two things. They want to be successful in continuing their personal growth. They want to be more valuable to the organization and they want to help the organization achieve its goals, whatever it might be. Yeah, and, and and oftentimes, in especially in a B B two B environment, uh, people like that tend to be a little bit risk averse, and so before you can sell to them, you have to earn their trust, right? Um, you mentioned earlier that it's really important to help your prospective customers navigate your company, and I listened to your podcast with uh, Rick Herman, who mm -hmm. was had been at Intel for about thirty years, and I I really enjoyed that conversation because it was two sales, uh, you know, highly experienced sales professionals talking in a cool, calm, collected manner, manner about the, you know, the sales process. And one of the key things that he said that he does is, or the value that he's able to bring to the table after 30 years at Intel was able to, he was able to help com uh, customers navigate this huge megalith megalithic uh, organization of Intel, right? So I think that's, that's hugely important. And um, if we contrast that you know, the, the amount of trust that's involved because, Hey, my job is on the line, you know, and I want you to help me look good. I also want to do what's good for my organization. If we contrast that to the B to C sales and a lot of the guys, and I want to get your thoughts on this and I don't want to badmouth anybody, but I, I would like to get your thoughts. A lot of the, the more well-known YouTubers on, you know, with sales channels, like the Grant Cardone's, mm -hmm. um, they are very much the Jordan Belfort's mm -hmm. about that charismatic, uh, B to C. I'm going to persuade you. I'm going to acknowledge your your objections, but I'm not going to really acknowledge them. I'm just going to use my acknowledgement as a way to kind of persuade you to buy what I'm selling. Right? Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts in terms of the two? Because it's uh, I think those persuasion skills are important in B to B, but if you play that hand too strongly, you might end up getting burnt. But your thoughts, please. Yeah, a couple of things. One is uh, one of the, and thanks for referencing the the interview I did with Rick Herman. Rick's a great guy, great. Yeah. and he's provided a huge amount of value. He's back at Intel doing great things. Um, one of the greatest sales leaders I ever met was a guy named Tom Snyder, not Tom Snyder from TV, but Tom Snyder who uh, ran a couple organizations, Huthwaite and some other organizations, the Spin Selling Company, and he told me that B two B sales professionals are professional persuaders. He mm -hmm. said, that's what we are in general. It doesn't matter if it's B2C or B2B. Uh, the thing about the, the Grant Cardones and the, and the, and the Jordan Belforts of the world is, is that they give people confidence, right? Yeah. Not everybody is going to be successful at what they do. 
you know, I give both those guys a lot of credit. I've been to some of Grant's uh, programs. Um, haven't really spent time with with Jordan Belfort. Watched the movie, of course. But um, <laughs> but well, what well, I've seen, you know, it's amazing because I mean, <laughs> I, I I read his book, uh, uh-huh. the, the Straight Line Sales. I think what's it the, the way of the lion, and it's the the sub the, the sub uh, title is the uh, the Straight Line Sales Method. Um, so much of it was in the movie. I mean, that whole, that whole dialogue where he's, you know, using to, uh, to getting people to you know, buy what he's selling, but go ahead, please. No, but actually, but, but the, the, the things that I like about what they do is that they really do give, give people confidence. And I've talked to a lot of people who've gone through both of their programs and sales is hard. Yeah. You know, the reality is being successful at sales is really, really hard. The, and when you talk about B2C, most people don't want to talk to salespeople. You know, at the Institute for Excellence in Sales, we we focus 100% on business to business and business to government. And the companies that we work with are the companies, the large enterprise companies like Amazon Web Services, Oracle, uh, Red Hat Software, you know, Microsoft, uh, Hilton, et cetera, Amazon Web Services, I might have mentioned. And again, they're dealing in the realm of B2B and it's complex and it's strategic, et cetera. And in the B2C sides, and most of the people who are going to deal with you, they, again, like I mentioned before, they know who you are. They need your product, right? You know, companies yeah. will need, you know, the technology to run their operations. In B2C, you know, you, you typically don't need what the salesperson is trying to sell you, right? So it's very rare for B2C salespeople to be successful selling to companies that, or customers, I should say, that, that don't want what they, what they offer. But if that's what you've chosen, you know, if you've chosen to be in the B to C space, you, excuse me, you got to have that confidence. You got to have like thick skin. You know, I was talking to, uh, I interviewed somebody yesterday for my show who talked about her uh, early experiences as a door to door salesperson. And she said she had to make 50, (laughs) she had to knock on a hundred doors a day. And she said that there were days that 100 doors were slammed in her face. Mm -hmm. And, but she had to do it and she chose to do that. And that was the method of selling that the company had embarked upon. So she needed to figure out ways to uh, make those hundred door knocks when she knew that the odds were a hundred percent or 99% that she was going to get the door slammed in their face. So just wrap up with the, those guys. One thing that I like what they do is they give people who don't understand how hard it is confidence. Now, are you then going to do anything with that? You know, it's still hard. You know, the hardness hasn't gone away, but at least they've given you some insights into how to be more confident, not to be concerned if the customer says no. You know, the woman who I introduced, who I I spoke to yesterday said when the 50th door was slammed in her face, she knew she had to go to number 51. And when 51 was slammed, she knows she had to go, she knew she had to go to 52. So if that's your task, you got to go through those calls and you can't go to number 52 and say, you know, you probably don't want to buy my product. You know, you still got to have the energy and, you know, the enthusiasm to in excite customer number 57 the same way that you do number three and number 98, if that's the game, because, you know, it, it'll be quicker for them to slam the door in your face. Yeah, I, I've done both <laughs> B2C and B2B sales. And, you know, it it, it can be very challenging. Uh, and and I... I would say that half of sales is this what we call what I call the inside game of you know what thoughts are we thinking you know when somebody says no how do we take that because if we take it personally that's a recipe for failure and just depression um, but so why don't you talk a little bit about you know some of the the internal aspects of sell, selling and you know what does it take to kind of break through those you know negative experiences or what could be perceived as negative experiences. No, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, it's like the old Yogi Bear line, you know, 80% is medical and the other is mental and the other 50% is in your head. Yeah, It's mindset. You know, I remember I, I did a poll of 20 of the top sales leaders that I knew. I said, you know, in one word, give me your advice on how to be successful in sales. And 75% of them said mindset, right? Mm-hmm. So, and like you said before, you know, the, the length between success is between your, your two ears. So, uh, you have to, it's a skill that sales professionals have to have. A couple of things. One is, uh, a couple of quick lessons. One is it's not about you. It's never about you. It's always about the customer. So if the customer declines you, and I used to struggle with this, 
you know, I remember I would go like days, you know, wonder, wondering why a sale didn't happen, right? Why didn't this customer What's wrong told with me, me, man? What's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with me? I'll, I'll, t- I'll share something with you. Yeah. Um, I, and this is one of the most valuable lessons of my life, a little bit different question. Um, I used to keep journals of, um, cause that was something that was recommended, write a journal every night. So for years I kept personal journals and I went back about three years ago and read all of my journals. I had probably a dozen journals in various places of the house and in my nightstand. And I literally sat down one Sunday and started reading through them all. And I noticed a couple of things about me personally that were holding me back. You know, we talked before about blocks and those kinds of things. But one of the things that I noticed was I would write something like, hey, you just got IBM today as a customer. Uh, how come you didn't get Oracle and Microsoft? Wow. Or good, IBM became a customer. What's wrong with you for not having a million dollar company yet or whatever the number is? Wow. And I would see this, I would see this mark time and time again. And I was like, why am I talking to myself that way? Why, you know, why aren't you just patting yourself on the back and going like, dude, I just got Oracle. That's, you know, yeah, that's, I just got IBM. You know, <laughs> no one else did. So congratulations, Fred. And I would I kept seeing this. And I went to a friend of mine who's a social coach type of a person. And I, I said to her, I said, you know, I read all these journals. And I also listened to about 100 uh, iPhone voice messages that I would leave. Uh, the same thing. I'm leaving a meeting. I would leave a message for myself. And the same thing, congratulate, you know, you got IBM. How come you didn't get Microsoft, Oracle, and, and Facebook, whatever? And I went to my friend and I said, you know, this happened. And she said, you know, Fred, she goes, you don't talk to me that way. You don't talk to Mike, you know, Arnie and, and Susie that way. Why do you talk to yourself that way? And I was like, that's a great question. So I remember this, this was the summer of 2021. I started doing some research on self-talk and I realized that my self-talk was horrible. And it really inhibited me from getting Microsoft and IBM and, and Oracle, right? Because yeah. I put myself in this hole of scarcity that, okay, I didn't even celebrate the win. I focused on the losses. So the reason I bring that up is I totally shifted my self-talk. And you know what? I'm glad I got IBM. And if for some reason I didn't get Microsoft and Oracle, what do I now need to do to get Microsoft and Oracle to become a customer? Not why... Have I failed at getting them? What do I need to do? Do I need to make more contacts at IBM and Oracle uh, or Microsoft and whatever, the one I didn't get? Do I need to understand more about what they do? Do I need to find some partners? You know, do I need to invite them to a personal workshop? You know, if I'm committed to getting Oracle hypothetically as a customer, by the way, Oracle is a member of the Institute for Excellence in Sales. What do I need to do as compared to what's wrong with you for not getting them? What do I need to do? And that changed my life, Mark, completely changed my life in all aspects of my life. And I recommend that to salespeople. I tell, tell them all the time. I'm like, celebrate the 99 wins. Don't focus on the one loss. And hopefully that'll get you to the point where you're not struggling with why are you losing? Because in sales, you're going to lose many more than you win. Yeah. Um, well, I, I appreciate you sharing that. And I, I think, you know, for most people, we are really our own worst critic. Um, and that negative self-talk is so destructive in all aspects of life, and it doesn't do you any good. W- you know, regretting the past, worrying about the future, you know, it, 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 if a sales call it goes sideways and you beat yourself up on it, it doesn't do any good. But the other part that you're saying is you have to celebrate those wins. Um, Tim Ferriss, I don't know if you've read any of his books, but he has a book called The Tool of Titans, which I highly recommend. And he talks about the jar of awesome. And he has a jar because he, he was prone to this negative, you know, self-talk and beating himself up. And every time something good would happen, he would write it down on a piece of paper and put it into the jar of awesome. And then, you know, like, oh, today I got this or today this happened or today I had a, a date with a pretty girl, whatever. He put it in there. And then whenever he started to slightly feel down, he would pull out the jar of awesome and he'd be like, oh, my gosh, look at all this awesome stuff. Right. And, and there was none of that awesome butt stuff that you had been journaling before. It was just, Hey, awesome. And I even say that, you know, that if you do those 50 calls and nobody says yes to you, it doesn't matter. You still have to pat yourself on the back and say, I did my job. Okay. Uh, That's all I can do is I can do my job. Right. So, um, you know, what else can we do to kind of develop some of those mental calluses 
um, that we need in sales. Uh, yeah. Hey, by the way, I, I used to um, carry tools of Titans in my car. And awesome. <laughs> yeah, every once in a while I would just stop and, or if I was going for lunch, just to look at my phone, I would just uh, read one of the chapters. That was a great book. Um, you know, here's the thing too. Sales is a profession. Mm -hmm. And if you're a, prof if you're a professional, what do professionals do? They practice, they learn, they try to be great at their skills. You know, a lot of people think that we talked about the word charisma a couple of times today, that if you have charisma, you could be great in sales. Well, like I told you before, I learned that some people might be great at the first call, but not at thinking through the sales process. Every sales engagement has a process. So if you're a sales professional, if that's what you are doing, the same way if you're a golfer, you're out on the putting green for two hours a day and you're on the driving range for three hours and you also hire a mental coach. You know, I heard that Tiger Woods at one point had five coaches, you know, so I, I, I use that example sometimes because <laughs> I, I do a little bit of sales training myself and, and I, I use Tiger Woods and a couple of other uh, very high profile people like the CEO of Google. And I say, you know, what do these people have in common? And they're like, oh, they're the best in the world at what they do. And I'm like, yeah, well, what else do they have in common? And I don't know. It's like they all have coaches. They yeah. all have coaches, you know, but please continue because it's important. No, <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's a great example. No, but, but sales is a profession. So if you're in B2B sales again, what do you need to do? Well, you need to be good at communicating your product and the value to customers. You need to be good at research. You need to be good at presentation and communication skills. You need to be good at using social media. You need to be good at bringing people together. You know, there's a, a bunch of habits that you need to be good at. So if you're a professional, you need to get good at them. You know, some of the great salespeople that I've met, again, they've been in the same industry for 20, 30 years. You know, people ask me, I'm in the Washington DC area. People ask me, uh, you know, what's your advice, Fred, for being a great salesperson? And I said, be the guy who sells Dell computers to the Navy. Right. You know, the Navy needs a lot of computers and Dell is a great brand. And if yeah. you are the guy who's in charge of selling Dell to the Navy, you will have a very big house. But you didn't just say yesterday, okay, I'm done flipping burgers. No disrespect to people who flip burgers. I want to be the VP of sales for Dell tomorrow. You know, you're going to need a 20 year career. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to have to start by making a hundred phone calls because that's what they do. They put people on the phone. And then if you're good at that and if you practice it, and if you have some luck and if you have a good mentor, like you mentioned before, and if you have some good coaching and if you invest in your career and if you become an expert on, you know, computing and if you become an expert in computing in government and if you meet somebody who is two levels above you, who likes you, who you're willing to ask questions to and they're willing to answer, you know, then maybe in 20 years, you're going to be the guy who sells, you know, who's in charge of selling Dell computers to the Navy. But, you know, you need to be a skilled professional. You know, somebody once described uh, for me, a guy I interviewed for my podcast, I asked, I said, you know, what is it like selling B2B to Fortune 100? He said, it's the NFL. He said, it's the NFL for sales because everybody's competing. Everybody who sells, you know, enterprise software solutions uh, is trying to sell to American Express. Everybody. Yeah. It's on their list. You know, there's a hundred offices right now where American Express is at the top of target lists or Ford or General Motor or, um, you know, even selling to IBM, selling to Department of Defense, selling to Hilton. You know, there's companies with long lists of targets. So you're competing against everybody and you're competing against companies that are already inside and you're competing against people internally who may not like you for some reason. Yeah, maybe somebody had a bad example or a bad experience with your product 10 years ago. And now they're a director of IT. And because of that, they didn't get promoted. You don't know that. Yeah. Or maybe they were using your competition at, at a previous company. They've transferred into a leadership role in this company and they've got that relationship and good luck trying to get through there. But, you know, you've got to work with that, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, not every company goes to the Super Bowl because they want to. Or not every software football team goes to the Super Bowl because they want to. You know, they got them. They have the right players. They have breaks. They have great coaching. You know, they have great ownership. They have a great field, great practice facilities, et cetera. What, the other thing I like about that analogy um, is that selling, especially at that level, is a team sport. I mean, there's no lone wolf that's going to go in and close a multi-million dollar deal with a Fortune 100 company. 
I mean, you, you know, you need, you need, whether if you're selling IT, you will need your, you know, your solution engineers, your solution architects, you're going to need, uh, probably you have somebody who's managing the relationship enterprise wide, but then you, you need the people who are managing your specific product area. And so there's so many different stakeholders involved just on your side, but then when you go to the customer side, right, and there's so many different relationships that need to be managed. I'm, I'm just curious because, I mean, you know, you, you, you're um, the Institute for, sale, for Excellence in Sales. You focus on B2B sales. What are some of your more popular courses right now, or what do you focus on to kind of teach those skills? Well, one thing we're very, very proud of is we're one of the leaders, if not the leader, in women in sales professional development. So, um, there's a long history of why, but we have a program called the Women in Sales Leadership Forum. It's run by a woman named Gina Stracuzzi. And we have women in sales who are uh, at the cusp of senior leadership. You know, maybe their director is moving into a VP role, if you will. We also have one called the Emerging uh, Women in Sales Leadership Forum, which is for women who are entering their first level of management, either as an inside sales manager or maybe a, a product sales director, if you will. and uh, those courses have women from around the world. They're hybrid. Uh, the emerging one is 100% virtual. And they talk about, you know, we bring two types of facilitators. We bring women in sales who have been there and done that. You know, women who have been at Oracle for 30 years or Red Hat Software for 20, 30 years or IBM. And they basically give a no BS. This is what I had to do. This is what you need to do, uh, young women, to be successful in your career. And we also have some of the top facilitators, women who are experts in women trainers who are experts in selling with empathy, prospecting, account development, if you will. So those are the programs that we're most, uh, we're most excited about. Before the pandemic, we used to do a program called our big stage. And once a month in the Washington DC area, I would bring a world renowned sales thought leader to DC and we would get 200 people on the last Friday morning of the month. We would have an hour's worth of breakfast and networking, and then we would have a speaker go for about two hours, kind of like a mini intensive workshop. We kind mm -hmm. of took a break from those during the pandemic. People weren't that interested in going to in-person things, but we right. just recently we recently restarted those as as hybrid, and we've had we're doing them at a uh, facility in Reston, Virginia, but we're also broadcasting those hybrid to companies around the world. It's not the last, first Friday of the month anymore. Now it's more like the third or second Thursday, but you can find all of those at our website, which is i4esbd.com. Uh, just search Institute for Excellence in Sales. But I'm, I'm thrilled to be working with sales professionals. You know, it's interesting is you think, well, gee, everybody should know this by now, but a lot of people are new. The world changes. Customers change. Things come on board like chat GPT, which right. in some cases has changed the game because uh, customers can now ask information, information-based questions. So Becoming successful in sales, it, it keeps getting harder and harder. But I'll be honest with you also, it's the most, not just financially, of course, but knowing that you helped a customer achieve its goal, right? Every company out there has a mission to, excuse me, to serve somebody. And it's really kind of cool to be part of that and seeing that you're helping those customers achieve whatever the valuable missions that they're going after are. Totally agree. Um, whenever I can help a cu customer solve a problem, uh, it, feel, it feels great. And it just, <laughs> deepens the relationship between you, the customer, your organization and their organization. Um, and, you know, it's like hitting a home run. It's like, wow, we did that. You know, <laughs> it's like my, uh, my, uh, my grandfather used to drive me around town and say, um, you know, I put the roof on that house and, well, we built that house. And, and he was proud of the work he did. And uh, with sales, it's a little more, what's the word, theoretical or kind of uh, abstract, but, you know, you did help that organization roll out that, you know, whether it's an yes. IT platform or whatever. So it's a, it can be very satisfying. Um, I, just a couple more questions here. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned how sales is changing. And for me, I used to tell my salespeople, the people I worked with, get the meeting, get the meeting. You know, that's you, you, you're nothing until you get the meeting. Right. And, 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 and then during the pandemic, it, it became virtual and the whole kind of, you know, landscape changed. Additionally, with the do not call list and, and then people being inundated with, you know, messages on uh, LinkedIn, what are you seeing now as kind of winning formulas to getting that meeting or get reaching contacts? Or is that, is that marketing jobs now? Or what, what, you know, what do you see? Yeah, that, that's a great analogy. And actually, I, um, I say that all the time. I say, you know, a success, we've talked before about celebrating successes. 
getting a returned email, right? Yeah. Getting that meeting with the right person, getting them to invite other people is still the goal. You know, there was a book that came out called The Perfect Close by a guy named James Muir, M-U-I-R. And I, like most people, thought that closing was closing the deal. You know, we're all striving to close the deal. And he talks in his book that closing, there might be 42 closes along the way. And right. you need to celebrate them all because you're always going to get to the, you have to get to the next meeting. You know, I celebrate a return email. You know, mm -hmm. when I see from a customer of ours or a prospect returning my email, even if it's a LinkedIn message, right? Or it's not really Facebook, but typically it's either going to be a email email. Yeah. Uh, very rarely do you get a phone call, almost never. Um, or, you know, it's a, a LinkedIn message reply is just as good. Yesterday, um, again, we're doing today's interview in, in the early part of March. I got a LinkedIn message from a guy who's a customer at, or is a sales professional at a large company that used to be a member. I call my customers members or partners of the Institute for Excellence in Sales. And I hadn't spoken to this guy in four years. And he sent me an email saying, hey, are we still a partner of yours, the company that he's with? Mm -hmm. And I wrote back. I said, no, nah, but we'd love to have you come back. Now that we're back to doing in-person things, companies are back to reaching out to us. And uh, my main sponsor from that company is gone. But he wrote back and said, no, nah, send me an email. I'll send it to our new guy. And I loved, used to love what you were doing. And we missed it. And we're excited to to start getting back into real networking events with sales professionals. Um, so, you know, you go back to those old relationships, see mm -hmm. where people are. I use LinkedIn all the time. You and I met each other on LinkedIn. Right. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to the senior most people on LinkedIn. You know, be genuine in the communication. You have to be personalized with why you want them to devote a minutes of their attention. Um, I still send a lot of emails. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I like to make phone calls. I don't make as many as I, right. as I should. <laughs> but, I'm a phone call guy too. I hate texting, uh, messaging, but if I've got somebody's number, I, I really want to call them. And then I have to be reminded because these days, especially uh, the younger generation, they consider phone calls sometimes to be quote unquote aggressive. And I'm like, I just call to say hi and see if you got my email. <laughs> That's what we do. But <laughs> no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a tool. There's a, there's an app that I use sometimes it's called slide dial. I don't know if you've heard of it. No. Slide dial, S L Y D I A L, and it allows you to go directly into the person's voicemail. And uh, I don't know how it works, but it does that. I used to think, oh, that's kind of wimpy and kind of cheesy, but I use it all the time and I get return calls. Yeah. You know, you don't know what someone's doing at three o'clock in the afternoon. They're, they might be in a meeting. I'm not going to pick up the call. I mean, I have some of our, our, of our customers who pick up the call and they're like, Hey, I'm at lunch. Can I call you back? I'm like, yeah, next time let it go to voicemail, but slide dial. It's, it's a great tool. It still works. It's free. And, uh, I, I use it very frequently to call people and it goes right to voicemail. And, uh, yeah, I guess it's some regard wimpy, but at the same time it, it does its job. No, I like that because a lot of times people, you know, everybody's dealing with a thousand different things and we're all multitasking. And sometimes, you know, you've sent the email, you sent a follow-up and it's radio silence. You don't want to be pushy, but you kind of know that, you know, sometimes what do they say? The greasy wheel gets the oil. So you need to kind of touch base with them. And uh, sometimes it used to be just the phone call be like, Hey, this is Mark. Just calling to see if you received my email. Oh yeah. Sorry, Mark. I'm going to get back to you. I promise. And then they do, but the, leaving the voicemail works, especially because a lot of voicemails, um, they get a text of, of the mail. And so they can just kind of scroll through mm -hmm. it. That's, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. That's wow. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Hey, let me ask you, um, you've got to make, uh, uh, well, two more questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, for salespeople who are on the front line and then they're looking up the food chain and they're like, I want to become a sales manager. And when you're on the front line sales, a lot of times you, you're, you know, you want that recognition and you're like, that's my commission, even though it is a team sport in most situations. Um, but when you move up to a sales management role, there are different criteria for success. And I think maybe different kind of, uh, uh, what would I call it? Personality traits that you might need to develop. What are your th thoughts in terms of if you want to move up the food chain and, and move into that management role, what kind of skills do you need to develop? You know, well, as a lot of the sales leaders who I, I spoke to like to tell me, when you get that first job in management, you know, your salary is going to be decreased by 20% because, <laughs> you know, it's not you anymore. You're now responsible for the team, even if you're a player manager. You know, moving into sales management, it really is about making other people successful. Mm -hmm. And some people thrive on that. And some people realize that they don't. You know, they're not very good at management. They're not very good at 
leading. Um, they are too self-centered and it's not a bad thing. It's just an is. And then you need to understand maybe I'm better suited in the individual contributor role. I know some people who have held the same job for 30 years. They never moved into management. They have the same territory. They have the same customer and they're making great living. You know, again, being in the right company for the right time. Um, so I, I have friends that, that make uh, on a good year, they'll get close to a million dollars a year selling, selling technology. Um, they're not in the leadership role at all. They don't want to be in that leadership role. On a bad year, they might make, uh, make, make half, but they're still living a very comfortable life. It, you know, didn't happen overnight. It took them 20, 30 years to get there. But yes. right now they're like, no, I, I wouldn't take the promotion if you gave it to me. <laughs> Right. But if you want to become the CEO or if you want to become, you know, a division leader or running a, a, be a GM, you're going to have to, you know, take on those leadership roles for the most part. There are yeah. probably some jobs where you have dotted line, but you know, you're going to have to get it. And the, the better you do become at it and the more you embrace it. And again, a lot of it's right place, right time. You know, um, I remember when I worked at a company called CompuWare in the late nineties, uh, they did mainframe and client server software. And the big thing in the mainframe world, people may remember, was converting the mainframe software to what they called Y2K, year 2000 compatible. Yeah. Every mainframe on the planet needed to be fixed. So the guys who were selling the mainframe versions of the software, they all made $800,000 a million that year. And the guys who were just as smart, if not smarter, selling the client server versions of the software, where Y2K wasn't an issue at all, you know, they made 80,000, 100,000 because all the customers were focused on their mainframes. They weren't focused on the Y2K. So a lot of it is right place, right time. But uh, yeah, it's a choice you have to make. Do I want to become a leader or do I want to, you know, maintain my territory, play golf two times a week, whatever it might be? Companies need both people and they need you both to be successful. Makes a lot of sense. Hey, um, okay. So last thing, I know that you're a big reader um, and I think that we've read some of the same books. You, you mentioned uh, Tools of the Titans. Um, if, if there's, you know, one or two must reads for anybody in sales, what would you, uh, in addition to your book, uh, what would you recommend? Yeah, I would, I would definitely encourage them to read insights for sales game changers, lessons from the top sales, perhaps top sales leaders on the planet. Um, if they also have a uh, Lyme disease in their world or somebody with chronic illness, check out my book, love, hope, Lyme what family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor need to know. But the two books I always recommend, um, have you ever heard of Gay Hendricks, the author of The Big Leap? No. So the book is called The Big Leap, and the author's name is Gay Hendricks. And I've read it out loud to people on occasion. Basically, he talks about when you get to your upper limits, we usually sabotage ourselves. Mm -hmm. And he talks about what you need to do to get to those upper limits, identify them, and then get above them. So an example would be, you just had a diet and you lost 50 pounds. That's great. But for some reason, you went to Baskin and Robbins and got an ice cream sundae. Okay, well, why'd you do that? Like, why did you do that? Or on the sales side, um, you know, you just made your number, but then you decided to take off Mondays and Tuesdays. Okay, well, why did you do that? Or you stopped following up or you stop making the hundred phone calls that we talked about before. Okay, well, why did you do that? Why did you reach this great limit and then reach it and not get above it to keep going on your progression? And he's interviewed some of the most successful people in the world. He had a follow-up book called, it's called The Zone of Success or The Success Zone, which is where you want to get to. But The Big Leap is the book that put him on the map uh, in this world, and it's a great book. The other book that I, I tell people to, to read, and um, it's uh, – it's Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. I and you're probably that. familiar with that book. Yes. And, and it basically, Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. And he talked about how he survived, luckily, as a Holocaust survivor. And then he talked about what he learned from that and what he learned in his mind uh, the meaning of life is. And I'm not going to ruin the punchline because there's a, a ruin, ruin the punchline, but there's a punchline at the end of the book on what he discovered, you know, the meaning of life to be. I'll share it with you. It's service. It's being mm -hmm. of service to your fellow human. And my, my saying, my personal mantra is the Einstein saying, only a life lived in the service to others is a life worth living. So uh, Einstein's only a life lived in the service to others is a life worth living. So those are two books that I recommend in addition to, to my two books. 
Well, thank you. And I think that's, uh, <laughs> you know, some very profound insights there about, you know, the importance of service and serving others. And it ties directly into what we're talking about with selling and delivering value to our customers and to our friends. So, well, hey, Fred, you know, I, I again, I'm totally honored to have you uh, as, a, as a guest on the Grow Fast podcast. And I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'll be putting links to your podcast, your books, everything into the show notes. And, uh, you know, thank you so much. And thank you. And congratulations again on launching the show. Uh, you did a great job interviewing me and uh, I hope you continue to do it. Cheers. Thank you.